cutthroat. This is how serious it was. Winning right now. Corey Harris, talented skills trainer and coach. Beijing was kind of like the New York Knicks. Bay Kong, where I was, like the Brooklyn Nets. One of the most sought after markets in the world. Lance Stevenson, OJ Mayo. Most of the guys that are there have that NBA stamp. The CBA, it's a destination spot. It's not a place for your average rookie because the demands are so high. We're talking about million dollar salary. Stephon Marbury, what can I say? That's like the Michael Jackson of China. From the NBA to the CBA, Corey Harris has seen his fair share of talented hoopers. Well, today we hope to get a glimpse into what it's like preparing them for such high levels. Corey is a talented skills trainer and coach who was previously working in the CBA in China alongside NBA legend Stefan Marbury. And we are so fortunate to have him today to get his insights into one of the most sought after markets in the world. Corey, how are you doing? Man, I'm doing great, Jay. Thank you so much for having me, bro. It's an honor. Love everything about your platform and what you do. Well, thanks so much for having us. Um, so I want to start off with, you've trained and seen players of all levels and all different skill types. And in your mind, what do you think separates a professional player from a college player? Well, that's a great question, Jay. Um, honestly, before I even get into that, I'm going to preface it and say I still feel like I'm seeing more. Each time I step into the gym, um, like the skill sets and the different combinations of rhythms and body types and the way people approach the game nowadays, uh, it, it continues to force me to have to expand my understanding of the game. But I think the biggest difference um, between the college level and the professional level is, first of all, the level of just intentionality by the athletes themselves. Um, most of the time, I say nine out of 10 of my encounters with professionals, they are telling me what they would like to focus on. They steer the ship. They drive the boat. Um, they have a very good understanding of their game. They have a very good understanding of like the time that they have, whether that's the hour that we're, to get, we're together in the gym or if we're going to see each other multiple times, like what they hope to accomplish in those different sessions and the different focuses that they want to take on. So they are much more intentional about how to improve, what it takes, what it requires of them. And they have a better understanding of the level of patience they have to have as well. The college guys, for the most part, they want results now, like everybody else, right? So, you know, although they are very eager and they have a lot of questions, they still get uh, very frustrated when, you know, they don't get from A to B as quick as maybe they want to. I was just doing a, a consultation two days ago with one of my college clients in season where we review his film. And he had been going through a rough patch for like maybe five or six games. They were losing. You know, he's like one of the top two scorers on the team, thousand point guy, division one transfer down to a D2. This is his senior year. And he's like, I want to finish it off the way that I see in my dreams and in my visions. And he wants to play professionally overseas. But he's not able at times to just deal with the simple fact that because you had a great offseason, and even though you worked and you did everything you were supposed to do, it doesn't always mean it's going to just directly translate as soon as you step on the floor. Like there's so many factors you can't control. So um, with the college guys, you know, again, I, I, I love working with them because they're just eager and hungry. They want that uh, pro experience. Right. They want to get to that point. Um, but the intentionality is the biggest difference among others. And in terms of a college guy trying to prepare like a professional guy, because the professional is really kind of intentional and they know what they're going to do and they have more patience, I guess, is more or less uh, what I took away from that. Do you think there's any way that you can, I guess, prepare that mindset as a college guy to try and get you pro ready in that way? Definitely do. Um, one thing that's helped me out a lot within the last maybe three to five years, and it's only because of I just have a little more resources than I did before. Um, I can bring a professional player that I feel like can help me mentor one of my college guys into that college player's workout at times. And so by them being like face to face or shoulder to shoulder with someone of a higher level who maybe plays a similar position to them or has a similar role to them, it helps them to understand what it looks like in person and what it actually feels like to work alongside somebody who is not like shortcutting the details, who's not just only focusing on if the ball goes in or not, but they're seeing all the smaller nuances. Um, one thing that I, uh, I will put as number two right after intentionality is just 
the ability to be consistent and make shots. Like when you see a pro work for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, you're probably going to see way more makes than misses, right? And with a college player, obviously it's going to be more than a high school player or a beginner, but it's still like drastic. Like it, it's so different, you know, and I'm not only talking about NBA guys, even overseas guys, right? Some of them are the greatest shooters that, that I've ever seen, right? So um, I think that at times you can help that mindset by just making it a, a real experience for them. If you can, bringing a pro into your workout. And then I think it's just about being honest with them and using real data. Like I've uh, a lot of times had to, you know, gather stats and numbers from my time working with professionals or even talking with other coaches and consulting with them and asking them like, hey, what does Kevin Herter shoot, you know, in his workouts with you? You know, if you got him in maybe, you know, June or July after the season was over, you know, and you tracked him all the way till he left in September, like what were those numbers like? And then showing that that chart or showing that data to a college player who wants to be a better shooter, a lot of times they start to see, OK, well, I have to set that bar higher. And that's what affects their mentality the most is just when you reveal to them what the standard has to be on a daily basis. Now, there, there's no uh, denying what you say to them as a coach. They can't argue with your reasoning. They can't argue with whatever you try to present to them in the form of the session because it's not based on your opinion anymore. It's based on the data, which you're proving. Yeah, I think everyone, universally, if you're a player and you're a shooter or a scorer, everyone kind of knows the barometer of 50, 40, 90, right? So 50% field goal, 40% three-point, 90% free throw shooter. That's kind of like the barometer of a great shooter. But something that's I think is less spoken about if you want to play professional or even high-level NCAA is what you should be hidden in your practice sessions. So like when I was playing, I would always say, okay, if I'm a shooter and I'm a smaller guy, I'm six foot one, six foot two, if I'm a shooter, then I have to at least shoot 40% in the game. But in practice, just like, let's say standstill, stationary shots, I gotta be shooting at least 70 to 80%. So I gotta make around that percentage for it to translate into the game. Because as you know, in the game, once the nerves kick in, you don't have as many reps, you don't have as much volume, you may catch the ball weird one time, the percentages are gonna go down. So what would you say would be like a good benchmark if you wanna be a professional shooter, a professional scorer? Yeah, for sure, Jay. Like this is an amazing conversation already because I've had people attack me in the comments about this. So I'm glad that we're talking about it. And you as a former pro, you just vouch for the importance of understanding the difference, right? So what I like to do is for my high school players, college players, and pro players, I give them three different benchmarks, whether that's we're finishing around the basket in a workout, we're pulling up off the bounce, you know, in, within the mid range or shooting off of the move, like off of a pin down. And then of course, any type of threes. So I like to say, if we're in the paint and you are a high school player, you should be making somewhere around like 80 to 85% of your floaters, your different touch finishes, pivot finishes, things like that. Why is it at 85 and not at something like 100? Because a lot of times you're introducing those finishes for the first time, right? A high school player, although they may be playing varsity at a high level within their respective region, they still are learning the game for the first time and they've not been exposed to every defensive matchup, coverage type, or even just like the height and length and athleticism that they're able to see because maybe they don't get exposed to a seven footer, right? So I, I try to tell them I need at least eight out of 10, right? If we're working on some floaters and we'll just stay with that until they can do it consistently. I'm not gonna even introduce anything new. If I work with a college player on finishes, then I'm gonna tell them I need nine out of 10 because they have begun to see the different height lengths. And now we're getting even more specific as to the type of finisher you're gonna have to become in order to have the chance to be an all-conference player or an all-American or even a pro because as you know a 6162 guy who's had who has limited athleticism is not finishing the same way that a 67 guy with you know elite athleticism is right so that number just allows me to say even if you're a 67 and I need contact finishes or you're dunking through contact or finishing dynamically you're still held to a high standard the same way a 6'1", 6'2", guy who has to shoot floaters off two or off one or running hooks does. 
if that makes sense. And then with my pros, we're not moving on to anything unless you can make 10 out of 10 every time. And Jay, you'd be shocked how many younger guys, when they get in the gym with a pro for the first time, and they're working on something as simple like downhill drives and attacking burst contact, they don't even understand like how skilled these professional players are because they just simply don't miss when they get within three to five feet of the rim. And these are guys that may not start, may not, you know, shoot the ball 20 times a game. They may only play eight to 10 minutes, right? They're, they're role players. They're assassins, right? They're only brought in the game for specific purposes, but they can still finish at a high clip. Mid range, I follow that same three tier approach where I expect a high school player to shoot around like 70% because then in a game, I expect that percentage to drop, right? Somewhere around like 30% or you know, a very, very good player. They're going to only drop like maybe 20 to 25% from workout to game. College level, if we're shooting mid-range pull-ups, I want them to shoot 80%. And then NBA or some type of professional, they're shooting 90% within the mid-range area, two-point area. Um, and of course, that's all either off the move, off the dribble or contested. You know, we're, we're trying to work a combination of those things. And then from three, same thing from three from my high school players. And it's very hard for a lot of them to do. They think they're good shooters. We actually had a session uh, just yesterday that was called the Breakfast Club, where all we do is we just come in and shoot for an hour before school, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And these guys struggle most of the time to make seven out of 10 from three. So, you know, that 70 percent mark I find at the high school level is very tough. And the ones who can do it on a consistent level, they are the ones that get college scholarships. That's just what I've seen. That's the data that I've gathered. Most of the kids that can't shoot that level at that level, they might play a position or a role that doesn't require them to be a shooter when they go to the next level so they can still get a scholarship. But the ones that either play guard or they're an off guard and they need to be able to knock down their three, they can't make that shot. If they have lim limited athleticism, they don't get college opportunities. And then college, obviously, eight out of 10. And with pros, some of them, you might not be able to get them to nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, simply because they play more so around the rim. But that's my benchmark for a guy like uh, Kevin Herter, who I worked with last summer, other guys like Mike Scott, who's been a client of mine for a while, like world-class shooters, they're aiming for a nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 every time we shoot. Yeah, and it's really like, it's really interesting when you kind of, when you look at the different levels within that they're playing. Because for instance, someone may be asking like, why is the accuracy so important? Yeah, obviously you want to be the best shooter you can be. But at the same time, people don't understand that. Say you're in Europe, say you're in like a higher level of Europe, you may only get six shots a game. And... In those six shots, you better, if you're a shooter, you better make four of those six shots or they're gonna find somebody who can make four out of six shots. So, so it's really, it changes a lot as you also go through your career because I remember like, for instance, when I was in college, I went to a very small college and I was like the man there. So I was getting 20 shots, my confidence is through the roof. They're running plays for me. They're doing everything for me, right? But then, yeah, but then by my first year of, Univers uh, by my first year of playing professionally, there's three other imports. And these three other imports have national team experience, they have D1 experience, maybe they ha already have pro experience under their belt. So now all of a sudden I went from first option to fourth option, and those are much different shots in that role versus the first and your confidence and your flow. So that's something that players also have to consider too, I think, is like, for instance, that's amazing what you were mentioning with your training. One thing that I do as well, like when I first started and I was like coming off the bench and professionally and I was getting less shots, what I would do is I would actually go straight into the workout with no warm up. So that was one way that I unconventionally tried to do it was that because when you come into the game straight out of the bench, you don't get like five practice shots to begin. You get, you come off the bench in the pros and you may get, two shots, and if you hit those two shots, you get a bigger leash. But if you don't hit those two shots, you're back to the bench. So I think it's also important that players also adapt different type of training techniques too, in that way to kind of mimic the game situation too. I'm not sure if that's something that you do, but that's something that I've kind of thought about and experimented with over the years. No, I love that. I actually, um, I heard that from, I don't know if it was 
oh my goodness, head coach for the Golden State Warriors, where I'm, Steve Kerr. I, I think I read that years ago when I was young. And uh, actually in my college career, my first year, I didn't play at all. So like when I read that article at the time, it really inspired me because I was like, okay, maybe this is a way that I can begin to start priming myself as a guy that's going to always have to come off the bench. Because my freshman year at JUCO was rough, and I was really trying to make sure that I did everything in my power to stay on the court. Well, working with guys who have different roles, I started seeing that we might not start the workout without a warm-up because I'm, I'm a big proponent on warming up, and I get where, where you're coming from with it. But I would actually have guys – shoot shots and then go sit down and then talk to them and maybe even show them 30 seconds of a clip or some type of a film edit and then just jump right back into the shooting drill. And now we're trying to figure out how to recreate the ebb and the flow of a game where if the horn blows and you got to come out for some reason, you still got to stay locked in. Or even I've just recently this year been beginning to mix in defensive concepts in the middle of like offensively focused workouts. Right. So instead of doing a just straight defensive workout with a player, we're shooting shots. He's in a rhythm. He's in a flow. He's in a lather. And then all of a sudden now he's got to do some type of a, a, a defensive slide movement or we're just working on a concept like chasing me over a ball screen. But then right after that, you got to go right back into that three spot shooting series just to incorporate the different use of your muscles. Obviously, you're going to get more cardio in playing defense. You have to get in a stance. Your body now gets heavy. Your shoulders aren't the same. So. Yeah, man, that's an awesome way I feel to uh, work with players that especially aren't like, um, you know, volume shooters or volume scorers. Yeah. And I guess also, what's your opinion on adapting the workout or adapting the entire training program based on the region that you are? I'm just speaking specifically for a professional right now, because as you know, in Asia or the Middle East, or in um, Latin America, it's very individualistic. It's one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of one-on-one -on -one skill-based stuff. Like you're not really coming off of pin downs. You're not really running a lot of plays in those regions. Whereas if you go to Europe, you're gonna be running different sets, different options, counters, all types of stuff. So it's gonna be, in general, let's say, it's gonna be a lot less dribbling and a lot more of like working without the ball and catch and shoot type of movements. Um, so do you, do you think that there would be a benefit in like, say there's someone who's going to Asia, do you think there's a benefit if I came to you and I said, Corey, I'm going to play in the CBA in China. Do you think there's a benefit in being like, okay, the whole hour or the whole hour and a half, it's going to be really focused on me getting in my bag. And in that way, you're kind of like neglecting that, that other aspect of your game though, about like catch and shoot and working without the ball. And it's a lot more one-on-one -on -one. and then vice versa. If I was going to Europe, I would maybe come to you and be like, Hey, coach Corey, I want to work on coming off of pin downs, a lot of catch and shoot, a lot, a lot of flare screens, stuff like that. And a bit less of one-on-one -on -one thing. Do you think there is a benefit in that? Or do you think that as a player, you should be always working on your entire package, your entire game, regardless of where you're headed? Jay, that's super insightful. That's an amazing question. And I will say that I made a huge mistake on that before 2020 or 2019, right? For maybe like the first 10 to 11 years of just my skill development and coaching career, I had no clue of anything <laughs> even remotely close to what you're talking about. But once I took the time to obviously, you know, relocate, move to China, spent that time in the CBA and just gained so much exposure to the different styles of basketball, it opened my mind to start thinking about how I could better serve my players. Before that, I had only been exposed to EuroLeague players or players who played in maybe uh, starter leagues within Europe. Um, my first professional client was 10 to 12 years older than me, had played overseas for a decade, and he was a big man. And so I only got the knowledge and information that he passed to me and his finite experience. So then going to the other side of the globe and being in Asia and working with guys like Joe Young, like I mentioned in our recent interview, you know, Andrew Harrison and, and Epe Udo and now Trey Golden, like I started seeing, OK, these guys really aren't playing your conventional team style of basketball. So how does that work into how I help develop players today? Well, first off, I'll say this on the pro level, region wide, like. It doesn't matter if they're in Europe or Asia. Triple threat is a whole different 
you have to teach it a whole different way. Right. And so that was one way that I was fumbling the bag earlier on in those beginning years, those that first decade of teaching players. I had no idea of even like how to change their style of footwork. Right. And then now appropriating that within the concept of what the teams expect of them. Trey Golden, for instance, he's going to have the ball in his hands 90 percent of the time. Like, I'm sure if I go look up his usage rate right now in the CBA for Sichuan, it's probably like higher than LeBron's, James Harden's, Luka Doncic, like it's, it's ridiculous. But that's the style of most CBA players like Marshawn Brooks and whoever else you want to name, right? So in his workouts, we've got two guys on the ball. We're blitzing him if we work on ball screens every single time, right? We're hitting him with pads. We're swinging the blocking sticks. We're trying our best to make sure that he feels like he's in a CBA game, if that makes sense. Whereas when I work with uh, the Sahar brothers, they uh, Dory, uh, Lord, I don't want to forget all their names, but these were great brothers. They're all from Israel and they play for uh, Tel Aviv, Maccabi Tel Aviv, right? So they're shooters. One's a playmaker and the other one was like a defender, right? But they're all coming off flares and pin downs. And if they're not coming off of it, they have to make a play for one of their teammates coming off of it. So yes, they may want to work on one-on-one moves. And as a, as a coach, I have to make sure that I keep them invested in the workout and make sure that there's an element of joy. But for 10 minutes, I'm sprinkling that in, right? Whereas with Trey, that's pretty much all we're doing. If in Trey Golden's workout, we want to work on catch and shoot threes. We're doing that after he drives to the basket, jumps in the air, gets fouled by three people, kicks it out, and then has to relocate for a catch and shoot three. Because the ball is just always coming back to him. If he passes it out of a blitz, it's boomeranging right back to him. So, you know, just having a better understanding of the way that the game is played in these different regions helps the players to have more trust in you as a coach and also believe that they've had a more efficient off season. And even if it's in season training that you're doing, but they're going to like take a lot more pride in it and it, they own it, right? There's more accountability from the player themselves. Because they can see, like, this is how I feel when I play. And, you know, now my workout makes more sense. Yeah, that that's amazing insight. Because I remember when I played and I first came to Latin America, um, I came from a college system where our coach was basically, it was like we were playing football. Like, every play was a play call. Every play was some set. Like, there was no freedom we're running this pin down screen, we're running this double floppy, we're running Spanish horns, we're doing everything. And then when I went to El Salvador, that was my first location, my first stop, it was complete opposite. Zero ball movement, just maybe a pick and roll, spread it out and you just give it to your imports and they work and they go pick and roll and they double and then you play out of that. And then for a while it worked and then I remember we went to the finals And then once you get higher up into the teams, they obviously get better players. So then I started being guarded by an import, a Cuban. He was a national team player. He was like 6'6", 6'7". I'm 6'2". And he's guarding me on the wing and I couldn't get like a shot off on him. And I really hadn't, I I realized, I really hadn't like worked on my one-on-one game throughout like my entire career because I just had a, I was a good shooter. I practiced shooting all my life. I had a knack for shooting. And then once it got to that scenario, I realized man, I really like can't really go one-on-one that much unless it's against like an inferior defender and I can't really use a pick. So then I like, that was like a moment that really clicked up in my head because um, I was, I'd been playing one way my whole life. And then I thought like, man, I'm already here. Uh, this is where you're going to get paid. This is where your market is right now. So like, I had this purest idea of what is basketball. Basketball is five players touching the ball. Everyone's moving, everyone's in sync. You're all working together. And then I saw this professional game and then I saw it in these different regions too. And I was like, oh, they play like that in the Middle East. Oh, they play like that in many of the parts of South America. Oh, they play like that in a lot of parts of Asia. So it's really interesting because you you as a player have to always kind of have that balance and act between you don't wanna pigeonhole yourself into one role, but at the same time, you also have to understand, like, how are you getting paid? How, where is your future? Is this your market? Because if that's where it is, then I would say, in my opinion, my advice would be to focus and double down more on that. Just like what you were doing uh, with your client, he's going through a lot of picks, he's getting doubled, he's getting bumped, he's relocating, because that's what it takes. 
and they don't they don't care if you're an American and you're like, oh, I'm not used to doing that. I just want to. They don't care. They don't care. They'll they'll find someone else who can do that, who can play that way, and who's going to get 25. So, you know, that's really kind of refreshing to hear that you say that because I think that's something that a lot of people, a lot of skills trainers don't even realize. They don't even know that, and they're training players a certain way, but they don't realize. They don't really like. Specify it to the region in which they're playing. So that's really interesting that you say that. And you have to if you really want to serve your players at a higher level. Like I said, I, I realize now that many of the times that I failed players, and that's not to say I didn't have energy. It's not to say that I didn't care or I didn't prepare. It's just you know our, our people perish for a lack of knowledge. Right? That's a that's a word that's written that we can never you know fight against or argue like that's that's a principle we can stand on in life in general right life is harder when you don't have information so you know just the the simple exposure of the job that i was blessed to receive it completely changed how i approach everyone that i deal with now so even nba players you know between nba and g league are vastly different i would say the g league is a lot more like you're up and down fast paced kind of just like you know uh, barn burning style of basketball, a lot of shots getting put up, you know, is survival of the fittest because there's, it's hard for a team to create chemistry. You normally have roster changes throughout the season, just like overseas. And then you have guys getting sent down from the parent team in the NBA who are on two way. So these are like your imports because they're going to get the most shots. They're going to have the higher usage rate. And if you're just a straight G league guy, you know, making $50,000 a month, you got to be a lot more efficient, but you still got to be a dog and try to figure out a way to, to last and not get cut. So when I work with a G League guy versus an NBA guy, sometimes that's drastically different depending on their situation. So you're exactly right, Jay. Definitely. And so you mentioned it earlier briefly. You did coach in the CBA uh, and then you did come back to the USA. So I think a lot of people are probably wondering uh, what was your experience like in the CBA as a coach? And what was it like in terms of the league and the players, how they use them, the imports, the foreigners? Because the CBA is like a, it's a destination spot, right? Below the NBA, there's really only probably the CBA and the EuroLeague, maybe the Spain ACB. There's a few leagues in a few countries that maybe are on par with China. So how was your experience in the CBA and how did you like it there? Man, the CBA and just my experience in China in general was amazing. Um, those are three years of my life that uh, I'm very grateful for. I'm, I'm grateful for life in general, but those are honestly some of the most um, trying times, right? It, it made me stronger. It exposed me to myself in areas where I needed to improve, but it also just made me understand like that there's basketball being played at a high level all around the world in places that you wouldn't really imagine. And um, so I started out as just a skill development or director of skill development for the Beijing Royal Fighters. I had to like really just work my ass off to even get that job. Um, I originally, even before that, started with the Guangdong Tigers, just one of their coaches as an assistant during their uh, preseason training camp in the mountains of Udamachi. And, um, you know, going from that to then taking a job with Steph, um, it was like a whirlwind. I was basically just trying to figure it out as I went. We were an expansion team at the time in uh, 2018 into 2019. So the management, they didn't even really know, you know, all the different ways they needed to delegate roles and explain like what your job description was versus this guy's. So I was doing a lot, man. I was uh, behind the bench for like the first three games. And then Steph and Jay Humphreys were like, nah, you need to come to the front of the bench because we need you to do X, Y, and Z and practice. Um, I had to be on the court as a practice player. I had to cut film. I had to also like create a playbook, you know, based off of everything that Steph was like throwing at the players every single practice. Um, had to translate it into Mandarin. I had to make sure that players had uh, pregame warmups. You know, uh, I had to lead practices. I had to organize, you know, shoot arounds and, and uh, transcribe notes from all of our film sessions. So it was a great experience from a coach's perspective because I didn't have a, a job description that you would typically have if you got an NBA job as a first year coach where they're like, you only do this. You sit right here. You don't say anything. You speak when spoken to. Right. That, that's how a lot of guys are. They either start in like the film room or they're an ops guy 
and they have to, you know, deal with luggage and, and, you know, travel accommodations. I had to do all of that plus some. So it was amazing because I got to develop so many relationships with the players. But I was also exposed to, you know, like the, the harsh realities of the CBA. Like you get close to a player or you get close to a group of guys and then you realize, like, this is a real business. You know, I had volunteered on the college level as a women's coach. I had coached on the high school level before. And then, of course, I had just done skill development stuff. So I never saw, like, people really getting cut or traded or released midseason. We had maybe three players start training camp with us that didn't even go into the second or third game of the season with us simply because preseason – our general managers and owners and, and and head coaches and everybody, they were just like, nah, he's not the one. And I'm like, oh, wait, oh, okay. Like, you know, it's not like, oh, you think he's going to figure it out or, you know, we just need a few more practices. Nah, he ain't got it out of here. And then boom, it was like just the amount of, uh, you know, I don't even know the word to describe it, but I guess just cutthroat, like just how serious it was, right? It was about winning right now. It was not about like a five year or 10 year plan. Um, that was a, a very like quick wake up call for me. But, you know, I would compare it to like, you know, any new thing that anybody out there watching this um, is embarking on, like whether you're a player or a coach, you know, I'm, I, I think even if you're a first year high school coach, it's probably a whirlwind if you're a first year college coach. Right. So I definitely don't want to minimize anybody's experience. Um, of course, you know, the culture there was amazing being exposed to the love. That's something that I think a lot of American players miss out on is they think that this is like the highest level of like fan appreciation, support, and just connectivity with your community that you can ever, you know, achieve or like experience. Overseas basketball is where it's at. Like the overseas soccer community is kind of like, you know, the the, the pantheon, like that's the, t the top of the top as far as like seeing the fans go crazy over, you know, their favorite players and teams. But the basketball kind of follows that trend. I mean, you got people in the stands with fireworks. you got people with blow horns. you got all types of songs and chants going on. People are waving flags. We used to go to the airport, and there would be people with, like, my picture on a cardboard cutout, and I'm an assistant coach. So what do you think they're doing for the players? Like, people would give us bouquets of roses you know, at the airports or at the, the, the train station when we're leaving the airport on the way to our team bus. Like, it was insane, you know. So to play in a large market, you know, uh, organization within China, I guess it would be comparable to, like, being in a large market situation in the NBA. Like, Beijing was kind of like the New York Knicks, so to speak, and, like, Bay Kong, where I was, we were like the Brooklyn Nets, if that makes sense, you know. So – it's like that that inner city kind of rivalry feel. Um, but Steph, Steph on Marbury, what can I say? Like, that's like the Michael Jackson of China. You know what I mean? So just even being around him, that had an aura to itself. Um, you know, he was larger than life to the people there. You know, so um, all of our games were like televised on like CCTV5 and CCTV5 Plus, which is like ESPN and ESPN Plus over there. Um we had great vets my first year, Kyle Fogg, who's now a, like two or three time champion with Lao Ning. Um, just being around him was a great experience for me as a young coach. Also, because although I'm older than him, he had been in the CBA so long that just watching his example of how he like dealt with his, you know, uh, Chinese teammates and the Chinese coaches. He knew the language enough to like make sure that he was professional at all times. He was marketable. But yet he was a dog on the court and he was a leader. He could put up with like being yelled at, held, you know, accountable by the coaching staff, but but still just like handle it all with grace. So um, that was amazing. Seeing people like Lance Stevenson over there my first year, you know, he had just left the NBA and was over there in China was an experience. OJ Mayo was in the in the CBA for the first time. Uh, there's so many others that I, I don't want to slight anybody, but, you know, it's definitely, like you said, a destination spot. I think, um, you know, most of the guys that are there have that NBA stamp, right? So they've already played at like a super high level. And then the guys that, that haven't, they've proven themselves in the EuroLeague. So it's not a place, you know, for your, your average, you know, rookie uh, overseas player, right? Because the demands are so high. That's why the money is so high. 
But, um, you know, and then for coaches, anybody watching this, if you want to, you know, potentially coach overseas, even if it's not China, you got to have an open mind. You got to be willing to try new things. You got to be adaptable. You got to be sharp. You got to know your craft, right? Because at all times, they're holding you in a high regard because they think you're an expert. And you should be if you were given the opportunity. And then you just have to be ready to work, especially in China. Like, that's what they believe in. That's what they stand on over there. So, you know, there were a lot of uh, weeks where it felt like they figured out a way to make it eight days instead of seven. And, uh, you know, we will work every single one of them. But, you know, when you win, they show an immense amount of appreciation um, and they pay good. Um, that's one reason why I wouldn't mind going back. You know, those bonuses, especially against your rival teams, were amazing. So good, good times. Yeah, China is definitely an interesting market because what, when I would do coaching academies there or coaching camps there, I never coached professionally or anything like that, but I would do kind of youth academies in my off seasons. One thing I would always find is that the Chinese, they'll definitely work you, but they'll also take care of you if you do a good job. If you do a good job, they're definitely going to take care of you and they're going to hold you in high regard, just like you mentioned. Um, and then you see that with a lot of NBA players now, former NBA players. That's why so many of them are going to China. It's also a shorter season. The salaries are insane there. We're talking about million dollar salaries or above for a lot of these players. So like we were mentioning, it is definitely like a destination spot. Would you ever consider getting back into coaching overseas or where are you kind of at in that part of your journey right now? Yeah, so my goal has always been since 2015 to coach in the NBA. It's always been, you know, I want to get to the highest level of whatever I do. And I think that's where all of us are as just individuals, as humans, right? As children, we always want to be the best at whatever. And um, I feel like it's the greatest league. But I would definitely, definitely um, coach overseas again, specifically coach in China again. At the time in uh, 2020, 2021, when I made the decision to come back home, you know, it was a really tough time for a lot of people all around the world. I actually stayed in China during COVID. So like I had the chance to come home for Chinese New Year, which is around this time, right, February. And uh, we had just won a huge game against the Beijing Ducks, who was our rival. Um, so, you know, the payday was good. Uh, they took care of my flight. I'm feeling great on the way back to Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, you're thinking that things are just going to continue as they have been. I actually didn't know that uh, a few months before that I had already had COVID. So, you know, we were on a road trip from uh, a few different cities and we stopped in Shanghai. And, man, I just felt deathly ill. Right. So fought through that for a few weeks and, um, you know, just thought I had the flu. But February of the, the very next year, that, that was probably November when I had it of, of 2019. So this is. February 2020, I come home and then the news reports, you know, start coming up. Was It was actually the day before Kobe Bryant died. So I think that was January 26th or 27th, if I'm not mistaken. So um, the report starts showing that, you know, this thing that we now know as COVID-19 was spreading. And so the messages start coming in from Marbury, starts coming in from the upper management, like, hey, if you guys are in a different province, if you're not in Beijing or if you've gone home to your you know, respective country, you don't have to return. We will not find you. So I looked at my now wife, who was my fiance at the time, and I said, like, we're not in a financial situation where I can not work. Like, this was basically our livelihood. And this was the first time that I had made, you know, a substantial amount of money. So I wanted to try to keep the, the thing going. So I said, you know babe, I know this might sound scary, but I need to go back. And so she, you know, being a, a soldier and just my best friend, she was like, listen, I trust you. And I know you wouldn't do anything to, you know, hurt yourself or destroy what we're trying to build. So, you know, although I'm afraid for you, like I, I trust you. And so, you know, I boarded a flight. I already had it booked because I was expected to go back and um, it was going to connect me through Detroit. And that was actually the the morning that Kobe Bryant passed. And so it was just like a weird time, man, of like, okay, should I be doing this? You know, and, and then I get on the plane and like, there's only like two people on the plane. And, you know, the stewardess doesn't even know, the pilot doesn't even know, they don't even have masks on. So then when they see me and the other people boarding the plane with masks on, like they get scared. We land in Beijing. It's like the walking dead. There's nobody in the whole airport. And Beijing International is bigger than, 
Hartsfield Jackson, which is here in Atlanta, and it's the biggest or most used airport in America, right? So imagine no one being in a large market, large city airport. And, you know, I go back to my hotel. There's nobody there except for like one or two people working at the front counter. They're afraid when they see me, like they're amazed that I'm even here. And one of my players, um, uh, Sun Yu, sees me and he played with Kobe Bryant and Pau Gasol. He won the finals with them. Right. So he was like one of the only Chinese players who had some real success in the NBA. He comes downstairs at the same time by accident. And we're like, you know, what the, are you doing here? Like, he's like, hey, well, I'm glad you're here because I don't know how long this thing is going to last. I need to stay in shape. He was a veteran. You know, his, you give him two days, he's done. And as you know, Chinese players smoke. So he, he needs me more than I need him. But at the time, he didn't know that he was my ticket to keeping, like, not just my job or whatever, but keeping sanity. And so we developed a bond for the next three to six months where every day we would go to the gym or we would work out in the hotel. We would run the stairs. We would work out in the lobbies. You know, we would sneak around security and sneak out of our room to, like, figure out a way to get back to our training base. And eventually the players were let out of quarantine there in China. And so I was the only coach that was there. And for another three to maybe four months, I would – I would do a FaceTime call with Steph and some of the other members of the coaching staff. We would create a practice plan. We would have a weight training plan and we would also have like skills and shooting. And for those three workouts, mostly maybe five times a week, I would have to just lead everything. Like we go to weights in the morning at six and then straight to shooting. And then we'd have evening practice and scrimmages. And as soon as Steph and those guys were out of their respective quarantines, they would come able to come back. You know, it was like we didn't miss a beat. We were ready to go and we hit our stride once the season resumed. And so um, I would most definitely, most definitely go back simply because that was a time where I didn't really know what to expect. Like I, I, I didn't know how life would ever go back to normal. I didn't even know if we would have a season. And the way that the organization took care of me, I was paid 100 percent of my you know, salary every month. They took care of me from the standpoint of making sure I was comfortable. Um, anything I wanted, they, they made sure I had it. And then they even gave me a raise after, you know, we went and resumed uh, playing. And then they gave me another raise at the start of the next season. So um, I know everyone doesn't go through that. Sometimes players don't get paid. Sometimes coaches don't get paid, even within the CBA. You know, I, I heard horror stories from some of our, our fellow, you know, coworkers from other teams. So, um, I don't want to paint a picture that's that that's everyone's experience. But um, for me, like I have nothing but positive things to say about, you know, coaching overseas, specifically in the CBA. And I think if you just are the type of person that is, you know, willing to be persevering and, and you know, dedicated to what it is you do and you just honestly love it, you're not doing it for the money, you will find a way, you know, and I think that's your story. And that's what makes it so great that we've connected is. You know, more people need to hear about the the positives. You know what I mean? They need to know the real and the hard parts, but they also need to know, like, just how you can get through. Right. So uh, most definitely, man, I, I enjoy the overseas game. I think now I would probably probably be a little better than I was you know, as a first year coach because I was so green. But, um, yeah, it's it's, it's one of the most uh, thrilling three years of, of life that I've had. Great experience. Yeah, definitely. And if you want to keep the NBA dream alive, I know a lot of coaches do. Uh, now you can see NBA coaches, a lot of them have overseas experience, like Nick Nurse. He was coaching in England. Uh, the current Toronto Raptors coach, Darko, I believe he was coaching in Serbia or somewhere in Europe. Yeah. Uh, and there's been a few others. So it's really becoming like not only is overseas becoming a viable path for players to make it to the NBA because now you see more overseas players with overseas experience than ever. You also see it with coaches as well. So that's why it's really interesting. Good to have you on the podcast as well. I feel like we could talk all day, but uh, I know you're busy. Uh, you got to get going. Coach, is there anywhere where anyone listening to this can follow you, maybe on social media or something? For sure. So um, I'm on Instagram. My, my personal page is just my name. 
uh, Corey Harris. You can follow my basketball coaching page at the transition underscore on Instagram. Um, it's the same thing on Twitter. I'm on YouTube as well um, at the transition. Uh, I'm on TikTok now. My wife was like, look, what are you doing? This is 2024, man. So like, you know, I'm catching up. And then, uh, of course, I have my official website for coaches and players where you can get uh, drill content. You can see our online curriculum where you can learn the business of basketball, how to build your own coaching uh, philosophy, your basketball IQ, all of that on the transition bball.com. So it's www.transitionbball.com. So make sure you guys check that out and I'll follow back. Most definitely. I was checking out some transition clips the other day. I saw you working with Mike Scott, uh, a few other overseas pros. So it's co pretty cool because Corey's basically going to take you through like a day in the life, a day in the life of a workout of an M of a former NBA player or an NBA player or a college player. And you're working with so many different players. So it's good to see exactly what we're discussing about here. Okay, how much does a high school player have to make? How much does a college player have to make? A professional, NBA to EuroLeague. So it's really cool because you get to see the breakdown and different things that you're working on. And then maybe players, younger players, or even older players can incorporate that into their own game. Uh, Corey, thanks so much again. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time. My man, appreciate you, Jay.